I just realized that I'm the first one who's going to expose you to fundamental science and even worse, it's even in my title, so it's fundamental aspects of my fabulous construction. And you see, fundamental science already created problems with the video production system. Um, so I'm going to talk about my fabulous construction just to tell you that I already learned something as a fundamental science from the clinicians. So there's a uh, the talk of, of Charlie, actually, I learned that in previous times people used to write up their most valuable thoughts and then use them later on as an insulation for their attics. <laughs> Whereas nowadays we write every personal garbage onto blogs and Twitter and Facebook and <laughs> expose to the whole world, nobody really cares. <laughs> and the second thing I learned is uh, from two talks, from, from Dr. Ryan, where I saw a chopped off arm, human arm on the operation table, and from Dr. Uh, Osterman, who told me that, that actually the, the Baron himself hunted down dead people and cut off their arms to that loose specimen. So now in my head, I have this image of Dupuytren's disease, plastic surgeons all having their personal cut off shopped arm in their basements. <laughs> so probably you can revise that over, over the next day or so. Well, you're going to see what image you're going to take from the fundamental scientists. So just to tell you that the work I'm going to present is not done by, my, by myself, but by the, these nice young ladies, uh, Lisiane Follonier, that's her, her, her thesis project, actually, and she was supported by, by Lara Buscemi on it. And, and what we're interested in is uh, that we have nothing to disclose because we're fundamental scientists, we don't make any money. <laughs> we, we always run around back for money, but we don't make money. And uh, actually, I kicked that on out after of the, of the presentation, but I found that uh, nobody introduced so far the Maya Faber Blast. So I'll give you a very brief introduction. You're going to have two or three talks afterwards, uh, going a bit more into depth. So a Maya Faber Blast, uh, in its most basic definition, could be defined as a cell which, which, or phenotype which produces stress fibers. So it creates uh, tension, it creates stress, it, it contracts. And a lot of people would use the expression or de novo expression of alpha muscle actin uh, in these stress fibers as one of the hallmarks of the myofibroblast. Though I have to tell you that uh, Professor Gabiani, when he discovered the myofibroblast, used a, a functional definition of this cell. So it's a contractile phenotype and not necessarily a molecular uh, definition by this alpha muscle actin uh, expression. But it's so convenient to have this marker that most people use it uh, as a defining feature. Uh, and again, as a function, these cells would produce high amounts of tension, they would produce high amounts of collagen, certain growth factors, and they're probably the culprits uh, behind the contractures that you observe, either may it be in, in hypertrophic scarring, in burn wounds, or in the dupedance uh, contractures. Now I have to handle these two things, that's interesting. Um, to give you a bit broader view on the myofibroblast, it's not, it's not only found in Dupuytren's disease and hypertrophic scarring. It is, uh, has been described first in normally healing wound granulation tissues. So it's, it's our friend in these situations because it's believed to contract the wounds and close the wounds thereby. But in most situations, we look at, at the pathologies of these cells or, or where the cells uh, appear and are, are responsible for, which is hypertrophic scarring, skin fibrosis, scleroderma, obviously Dupuytren's disease. And that's a slide I always use. You see Dupuytren's disease is already at third, third position, so that's pretty good. Uh, and, and then you have fibrotic respons responses to implants, lung fibrosis, heart fibrosis, any organ fibrosis basically contains a, a myofibroblast uh, component. That, that leads to the fibrotic uh, reaction or that, that creates the fibrosis, actually. And then you have other, probably less well-known um, pathologies where myofibrosis is involved, which would be atheromous plaque evolution, chronic asthma, uh, and more recently, more relatively recently, is the stroma reaction to tumors is also one big field where the myofibrosis plays a role and actually stimulates tumor growth by creating a certain chemical and mechanical environment around the tumor. So these two, two cell populations Crosstalk. And I'm going to skip over this very briefly uh, because in Dupuytren's disease, probably, well, I would guess the, the local fibroblast is probably the most, most important precursor cell of the myofibroblast. But in other organs, other situations, or even, um, or in the same situation, other cell types have been shown to contribute to the myofibroblast populations. And I, I'm not going to go into this. I hope that Sam Tan is going to, going to talk about this for, for, for one or two or three seconds or so. So just to tell you that different precursor cells can undergo this myofibrillus differentiation, uh, telling you that the myofibrillus itself is probably not a cell type, what you would think is a cell type, but rather a phenotype of a cell that different cells can attain. And it's a, it's a functional thing, these cells contract. So let's look at this very closely. It's the last time on my talk you're going to see a clinical, directly relevant picture. Um, you can also look at the right side if you want to be 
boost your cell doing? So the question that we pose is how does the work of, of individual cells, and this is now a fibroblast which is in a collagen gel in vitro, so outside of the body in a, in a, in a, in a three-dimensional gel. You see that cell or the reflection of this cell crawling, actually you saw it. Let's see if I can make it recrawl. Probably not. So you saw it crawling and, and, and working on the matrix, working on the collagen fibers, and reorganizing the collagen and, and compacting the collagen. And we think that's what's happening here in, in, in the duplex contractor as well. So the cells over time would contract the matrix and, and, uh, and fundamentally reorganize the matrix. In a, in a, in a, that's important in an irreversible way. So uh, we ask ourselves, so what is the, what is the mechanism that, that controls this contraction? And then I, I can't really spare this to you, but um, if, you, if you're over this, you, you pass the worst, I, I, I swear. So uh, this, is, this is a model cell. You, after stimulus from the outside, the cell, if, it's, if you look at contraction, has two major pathways which can lead to the contraction, so, so pulling, basically. So one pathway is, is the calcium pathway. This is pretty much working like in smooth muscle cells, so that's where you know it from. Calcium would enter the cell through channels or from inside the cell in stores, would go into the cytoplasm. Uh, that calcium would bind to a protein called calmodulin. This complex would regulate the myosin light chain kinase, and if this protein is active or this enzyme is active, it would phosphorylate the myosin light chain, in an, and then myosin can interact with actin. And you probably still remember this from, from physiology. Uh, Actin-myosin creates uh, the contraction. And that's, as I said, the, path, the major pathway in smooth muscle cells. And, and myofibrillas, by virtue of expressing alpha smooth muscle actin and by being so contractile, share a lot of similarities with smooth, smooth muscle cells. Uh, and then on the other side, you have the so-called rho rock pathway. And, and that is working as follows. So this, this, this pathway, once activated, is not working on the enzyme which puts the, puts the phosphor, the phosphor uh, on the myosin light chain. It's actually working on the enzyme which takes away the phosphor. And it's inactivating this, this enzyme. So that leads, on the long term, to, to, the, to the nut removal of the phosphate. And, and thereby, the myosin is, is constitutively active. And what we think is that the roro kinase leads to, to a long-lasting, persistent contraction, whereas the calcium pathway, because it's taken, the phosphate is taken off, uh, leads to very short contractions here. Now, the second pathway, this roro kinase pathway, is, is thought to be the predominant pathway in the fibroblast, and the myofibroblast shares also lots of features of the fibroblast. The question is, so what is the myofibroblast doing here? How is the myofibroblast contraction regulated? And, and it's important to know that because, well, our aim as fundamental scientists is to feed you with thoughts and ideas how to interfere with myofibrillus contraction. To interfere, you usually have to know with what measures and what, what, what mechanisms you have to interfere. So in this study, what we do is we don't culture our cells. So these, these are cardiac myofibroblasts, but I, I, I swear to you, it would also work with skin myofibroblasts. We use some of those, and probably also with fascia uh, or, or, uh, or, or uh, tendon fibroblasts. So we culture these cells on, on silicone membranes which are soft. We don't culture them on, on stiff plastic dishes because we just heard, for instance, that mechanics play a role. So this is the only slide I'm going to show this here. But uh, the, the sheer fact that you put the fibroblasts on a plastic dish transformed them, or a good part of them, into my fibroblasts. And to avoid this, or to at least tune the cells to a stiffness that they are used to in the body, we use uh, soft silicone elastomers, and we stain them for up muscle actin. These ones are selected to reproduce pretty much um, the stiffness of a scar. So this is the range of, of how, how, how stiff your scar would be. And they're happy cells over passage. They express alpha muscle actin in red, so they become myofibroblasts in these situations. So these soft substrates have another advantage, which is that this, it's so soft that the cells can, can create deformations in the substrate. So when the cell is pulling on a substrate, it would create these wrinkles, which we see here with this, this topography image here. And you're gonna see one, one movie from Professor Gaviani later on. Uh, and that's, that's a way how we can analyze and see how contractile is our cell, how, how strong is it pulling in our in vitro system here. And you're gonna see more images later on. Now, we want to combine the contraction visualization with, with the calcium dynamics in these cells. I remind you, calcium is one of the regulators of contraction. And uh, if you look at this, this movie, uh, you probably barely see that, that these are cells which are loaded with an indicator indicating uh, calcium rises in the cytoplasm. If they become bright, they have a rise in calcium. This is a movie uh, 
over, over several minutes. What you see is the cells, the, and you analyze these calcium rises or the fluorescence of these cells over time, then you see these peaks or these, these waveforms. That means these cells regularly have calcium rises in their cytoplasm in the cell culture system. And it's, uh, well, I spare you the details, but approximately every minute you'd have a calcium rise in these cells. And nobody really knows what is the function of these calcium rises in the fibroblasts? Well, a lot of studies have done that in smooth muscle cells, and they say calcium rise leads to contraction, but what is happening with the fibroblasts here? Now, the problem with these calcium rises is they're very short-lived. Uh, they occur in relatively high frequency. So how, do we, how, how can we see whether these calcium rises lead to, to single contractions, which, which are supposed to be very small, uh, in the range of several hundreds of or tens of nanometers only, which is just in the range of what you can visualize with a microscope. And to, to visualize these, these contractions, we put beads on top of the cells, which are coated with an exocellular matrix protein. So the cell would perceive these beads that you see here as exocellular matrix, would, would connect to it, and would start pulling on it. And the movement of these beads, uh, which couple to the cytoskeleton and to the alpha muscle actin, that will tell us about the contractile state of these cells. Uh, and that's what we see here. This is the cell uh, transfected for alpha muscle actin in, in fluorescence, so it's inverted. Um, never mind, you see one fiber, one stress fiber here, a contractile fiber now in the cell, not a contractile fiber in the hand, um, but it's, it's analogous in a way. And you would see, okay, there we go. Oh yeah, you would see that, that, try again, okay. Uh, imagine that the, this beat here would slowly walk up here. Oh, there we go. So you see what imagination can do to you? <laughs> and it's done. And you would see that the, the stress fiber itself would contract the same way. So the, the contraction of this single fiber in the cell leads to the movement of, of this, this beat here, which is coupled. And we can analyze this by doing fancy tracking software uh, with the computer. Now, at the same time, by tracking the beads which are on top of the cell and pulled by the, by the more or less free side skeleton, we can also visualize uh, these wrinkles here. And I'm afraid the movie's probably not going to work, but uh, then probably you have to believe me in a way. Um, so, let's see, probably I can make it work. There we go. Very slow. Okay, so this cell is sitting on these wrinkling substrates. It's pulling on the substrate, pulling the substrate in and making these wrinkles. And we can observe the movement of the beads on the surface of the cell at the same time as the wrinkling behavior. So that the long isometric tension that the cell uh, is exerting to the substrate. And now if we completely block contraction by using this drug called blebistatin, never mind about the name, uh, you would see as soon as we put the drug here, the beads don't move anymore and the cells would lose completely this wrinkling behavior. So you completely abolish any tension in the cell. The cell is nice and relaxed and, and cool on the substrate. And then uh, I, I spare you all these details here. This is the tracking of the beads. Just basically telling you what you, what you would have seen on the film uh, is that the bead movement stalls and then the wrinkles disappear here. So the effect within 10 minutes of this drug treatment is the wrinkles disappear and the beads don't move anymore. The cell is completely relaxed. So now think about we have these two pathways. One is the calcium pathway that we want to test. What is the role of this pathway? On the other hand is this row pa pathway. So what, what scientists do usually is they kick out one of the pathways and check what is, what is happening in these conditions. So here we have the same setup cells on these wrinkling substrates. We observe beads uh, which, which would move theoretically on, on the surface. And then we add a control, which is uh, 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 a drug which is blocking this row row kinase pathway completely called Y27632. So that's the kind of things we have to deal with, funny names. Um, what you see if you put that drug is, and I, I resume that for you because the movie is kind of staccato-wise, uh, if you put that drug after a short, uh, short period of uncertainty, the beat continues to move happily uh, ever after, so it's not affected by the drug on the long term, uh, meaning that the row row kinase pathway has no influence on these small contractile events that are visualized by the beads. <coughs> Whereas it completely disassembles these wrinkles, so they lose, the cells lose their isometric tension uh, completely. So as a baseline, the row row kinase pathway, if we go down here, the row row kinase pathway is controlling isometric tension of the cell, so that the strong, long-lasting pulling of the cell, but it's not affecting these small contractile events which are transduced to the beads here. And I hope I get one extra minute for technical problems. <laughs> 
Now the second pathway is the calcium pathway. By interfering with this pathway, again we observed what is happening to the isometric tension, the wrinkling of the cells, and what is happening to the bead movement here. And the drugs we use are tapsigargan and 2-APB, never mind about, about these names. And I'm going to summarize this uh, again. If you add the drug, then the bead mo movement completely stalls. So this is different from what we've seen before. And the wrinkles, the wrinkles would not disappear. So the bead movement now is affected, but the wrinkle uh, formation is not. Meaning the isometric tension is still promoted because the row row pathway, row row kinase pathway is still active. But the calcium is regulating these small contractile events. So as a, as a, as a kind of a take home message, in, in the cell system, which is still in vitro, you have two pathways going on. One is regulating isometric contraction. The other one is uh, regulating very small contractions. And if, if the technology allows me, I'd skip to the model. There we go. So the idea that we have how, uh, that how the whole thing uh, is working, how the myofibrosis is contracting, how very small contraction can lead to a contracture, which is irreversible, is the following. So imagine you're sitting, you're sitting, uh, sitting here and trying to contract a rubber band. What you have to do is to, to shorten this rubber band, is to pull it in, and then you create uh, a kind of a, a slack in this rubber band. And the rubber band for the cell is actually the extracellular matrix, the collagen here. This is the stress fiber. You have a, a strong, long-lasting contraction of these stress fibers mediated by rho rho kinase. You create slack in individual collagen fibers. And now these, these very small contractile events can now work on these stress-released fibers and pull them in, remodel them. The fibers would take over the load again, and the cell can re-spread out and, and, and do the same process again. So you have, you have two cycles. One is a long-lasting, low-frequency cycle over probably days, where the cell is, is contracting strongly and then remodeling on a local level. And once it's it locally remodeled, it can re-spread out, and the whole thing would start over again, and, and o over time would lead to these, these contractures that you observe in a clinical uh, situation. And <coughs> Thank you very much. I end with this picture of my group, which was still in Switzerland and now in Toronto. Uh, I lost them all on the, on the rundown. So I, had, and I was kicked out of the country because of that. <laughs> <laughs> and,